Right, okay, this is the last lecture, as you're probably aware. So if you come next week, there won't be a lecture. Um, and today we're going to be looking at mental causation. Um, and I must say, this is such a huge subject that the thought of doing it in one week um, is really quite daunting. Apart from anything else, I know too much about it, um, which never helps when you're lecturing. Um, so, anyway, we're going to be looking at mental causation, uh, and I'm going to be taking you through several really quite difficult arguments. Okay, so the general public, that's you, <laughs> um, believes or tends to believe that the mind is the brain. Um, and what that means is that mental states are brain states. Um, but it's difficult to see how this is possible. And I'm going to show you why it's difficult to see how this is possible. Um, they have very different properties. Uh, and let's do this together um, rather than me do it on the board. Uh, let's put the mental over here and the physical over here. And let's look at objects, properties, um, and relations in each case. So ob physical objects would include things like pens, flip charts, um, bodies, billiard balls, and lots of other physical objects you can think of. What about mental objects? What sort of things? I'm using the word object very widely. What sort of thing is mental? Ideas. Ideas, yep, yeah. OK. A dream. Um, we can put dreams. Uh, dreams, uh, it seems to me, are, are combinations of objects. They're very complex objects uh, that occur over time. But let's put them in. OK. Intentions. Uh, sorry? Intentions. Intentions, yep. OK. Fears. Fears. Fears, OK. Or emotions more generally. So love, hate, etc. tend to be... Pens yes. are mental. Yes, I have a concept of a pen. Oh, concepts, pen. certainly. No relation to a physical pen. But pens are over here, but <laughs> concepts are, are in there, certainly. <laughs> yep. Concepts are constituents of what? Perceptions. Uh, perceptions are over here. Yep. OK. Concepts are not constituents of perceptions. Or, well, yes, they are. Yep, they can do. Um, Sorry, decisions. decisions, yep. OK, nobody's mentioned beliefs, so I'm going to put it in there. OK, so, so we've got things that are, are very different. Um, pens, flip charts, bodies, billiard balls, uh, as opposed to fear, love, hatred, beliefs, ideas, objects. Uh, sorry, not objects, perceptions, decisions, concepts, etc. So very different sort of objects. Uh, and Descartes says that uh, he starts off thinking these things are rather ephemeral, um, whereas these things are pretty solid. I mean, they, they take up space and so on. Let's have a look at the properties. What sort of properties do physical objects have? Dimensions. dimensions uh, three dimensions. Four colours, yep. Mass. Uh, mass, okay. Size or mass. Theoretically, they exist extrinsically. Uh, extrinsically to what? To uh, the mind. mind. Okay, we're, we're not going to look at that for a moment because, <laughs> um, okay, that, that would be relating the two, which we're trying not to do at the moment. Um, so, any other properties that physical objects have? We've got so colour, mass. Uh, in time, you mean? Yes. 
Uh, okay, uh, duration, continuity. Okay. That may be something that mental states have too. It wouldn't stop mental states having it as well. Yeah, no, but, but it's interesting that that's... I mean, mental states don't have colour, do they? I mean, even ex an experience of green is not itself green. Um, and they don't have mass either, do they? Um, so you don't have a, a belief that weighs two pounds or two ounces or something like that. Um, Physical shape. Shape. Okay. Physical limits, do you mean shape? Uh, okay. Uh, some physical objects have liquidity. Um, <coughs> phase or, yes. Um, different phases. Well, why doesn't a belief have a mass? Yes. Okay, well, I'll tell you, let's talk about what the properties of beliefs are before we look at why they don't have the same properties as physical states. What sort of properties do um, fears, beliefs, concepts, etc. have? So if we say a belief is, so we can say uh, a billiard ball is red, a billiard ball is round. Uh, if we say a belief is... Uncertain, um, uncertainty, okay, anything else? A belief is true, true, true or false? <laughs> um, well, can I put that up here at the moment? Okay, so, sorry? Erroneous. Erroneous, so uh, would that mean false? Yeah. Yep, yep, we've got false there. Um, motivational, certainly. Okay. Um, we might have justified in here. What about experiences? Change. Uh, mutable. Okay. Well, that's something again that seems to be in common, don't? Uh, isn't it? Mutability, um, because beliefs can change, but so can billiard balls or leaves, or pens, etc. Okay, what about relations? What sort of relations do physical things enter into? Spatial, uh, spatial relations. So the, the pen is in Marianne's hand. Marianne is in front of the flip chart. Um, spatial relations. Proximity and um, Okay, might that come under spatial as well? <coughs> Uh, causal, certainly. Um, that's possibly one that uh, can be both. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Time. Uh, temporal, certainly. So if we think of events rather than um, objects, um, they would tend to be, they would be in time. And again, that might be something that's, that's common to both. Okay, anything else? Gravitational. Uh, gravitational. Um, Okay, what about um, mental states? What sort of relations do they come in? Do they have spatial relations? Is one belief beside another, or in front of another, or on top of another? It might be if it's conflicting. Um, they, c they can certainly conflict. How do beliefs conflict? <coughs> Sorry? Okay, uh, contradiction. Uh, can I say that contradiction and conflict um, are both rational relations? So a belief can be rational support, evidential support for another belief. Um, a belief can contradict another belief. A belief can be consistent with another belief. Um, a belief can be evident, uh, sorry, entail another belief and so on. Um, truth and falsehood we've got up here in properties. Um, not, not relations, but you might be right. Uh, they might be better in relations. In fact, truth is, is probably a relation between the mental and the physical. The point of all this is to 
Um, we haven't ruled out the possibility that the mind is the brain. So neuron 476 might be a true description of a belief. Um, but we're going to leave that out at the moment because that's, if, if it is a true description, it's very much a theory that it is. But we know that beliefs um, have contents. They've got to have contents. You can't have a belief that hasn't got a content, can you? A belief that isn't about anything. Could you have such thing? So aboutness or intentionality, as we call it. Um, do you have physical objects that have intentionality? I can think of two that you might think of. Physical objects that have aboutness or intentionality. Words, tendency. Um, words, interesting. Um, it's certainly the case that um, sentences have aboutness, don't they? A meaningful sentence is about something. Uh, but what makes it about something? The fact that it expresses a thought. It's the thought that's about something. If, if, a, if a parrot utters the same sentence, it doesn't actually have any meaning, does it? Um, not in the same way anyway. Uh, if it has meaning, it has a type of meaning rather than a, the parrot doesn't mean anything by it. Alex what? Alex did. Remember Alex the parrot? Um, Alex is a, an interesting question. Um, he never actually put together uh, he, uh, grammatically any two no. words. Um, uh, well, some many philosophers think that fl meaning does depend upon grammar. Um, that you've got to have a combinatorial grammar before you have meaning. So um, there was a chimpanzee that signed water bird and people got all excited because they thought that it had seen a duck uh, or something, but it was actually signing water and bird, not water bird, which would have been much more interesting. OK, um, the point of this is to point out how very different, and there are things that they have in common. Um, I mean, time seems to be common. Uh, to, so both mental things and physical things ha uh, have duration in time. But mental states don't have spatial dimensions, do they? They don't have mass. Who said that why don't beliefs have mass? Do you think you, you did? Is that because you believe that mental states are physical states? Yes, OK, again, we're going back to the... Um, if we bring a theory in that mental states are physical states, then obviously everything with this, this type of property... Uh, sorry, m things with this type of property have also got to have this type of property. Um, so uh, if mental states are physical states, there are physical states with contents. There are physical states that are about something. There are physical states that are true. Um, notice that truth is a property of beliefs or the sentences that express beliefs. There's nothing else that's true or false. Lots of people want to disagree with me at that point, do you? So my belief that the chair is blue is true. What makes it true? is the chair's being blue. So there's a fact, which is the chair's being blue, that makes true my belief that the chair is blue. So the belief has a content, the chair is blue. It's made up of concepts. And the concepts uh, are made true by a state of affairs in the world, namely the chair's being blue. OK, do you see how very different mental states and physical states seem? at least initially. So if we're going to say that mental states are brain states, we've got to show two things. So mental states, the essential properties of the mental uh, consist in either qualia or intentionality. So there are two types of mental state, roughly, um, qualitative states and propositional attitudes. Qualitative states are things like experiences of red, experiences of fear, experiences of um, happiness, that sort of thing. And all of them have a, a quality, a raw feel to them. If you've got toothache, 
you know you've got toothache because it has a quality of hurting. Um, or there are the propositional attitudes, the attitudes to propositions like beliefs, intentions, desires, um, all of which have contents or aboutness. So you can't have a belief that doesn't have a content, um, that doesn't have intentionality. So two types of mental states, the qualitative states, the essential properties of which are qualia, and the propositional attitudes, the essential properties of which are intentionality. And it's their intentionality that enables them to be true or false, um, and enables them to be justified, enables them in to enter into rational relations. Notice that physical states don't enter into rational relations. Um, if we think they do, it's probably because there are rational relations between the beliefs we have about these physical states. The physical states themselves don't justify anything or entail anything. Okay, and physical states, the essential properties of the physical consist in extensionality, so space-fillingness, three-dimensionality. Um, so you'll find all of this in, in Descartes. He's the, um, you'll find all the references, as usual, on the handout. Um, but it was Descartes who looked at the real differences between the mental and the physical, and he thought that they couldn't possibly be the same thing. I mean, if you think about an object, you've got to be thinking about something three-dimensional, um, according to Descartes. OK, so they look very different, but we've got a dilemma. So states are not mental unless they have either qualia or content, uh, and physical states have neither qualia nor content. At least they don't have it necessarily. Perhaps they do have it. Um, that's something that we're going to look at later, um, but they don't have it necessarily. Um, and states are not physical unless they have extension, space fillingness, three dimensionality. And mental states don't seem to have extension. Um, certainly, they don't have it necessarily. Um, we don't think of a belief as occupying uh, space unless we're assuming that beliefs are physical states. So. The question is, how can states with such very different properties be identical, be states of the very same kind? Um, but if mental states are not physical states, the problem of mental causation arises. If you think mental states are physical states, you haven't got any problem with mental causation because they've got the same properties and physical states can cause physical states. So if mental states are physical states, there isn't any problem with mental causation. The problem with mental causation arises only if you can't show that physical states are mental states. So if mental states and physical states are quite different, then the question comes in, how can they causally interact? OK, in the 40s and 50s, and in the handout you get all the references, of course, in the 40s and 50s, many philosophers thought that uh, mental states were contingently identical to physical states. So they thought that um, pain states, for example, were contingently identical to C-fibre firings. Um, that's because empirical studies showed that when humans were in pain, um, their C fibres fired. Um, OK, but they can't be necessarily identical, people thought, because dogs don't have C fibres. Actually, I have no idea whether dogs have C fibres, but say they don't. Martians don't have <laughs> C fibres. Um, but surely dogs can be in pain. So if we say that pain is C fibre firing, um, it can't be a necessary question uh, c claim because that would be tantamount to saying dogs can't have pain and that's ridiculous um, and we also want to allow that Martians have pain etc so that's all right says everyone um, mental states are only contingently identical to uh, C fibers firing so human pains are contingently identical to C fibers firing end of problem but then Kripke came along this is Kripke my favourite photograph of him. Um, and Kripke, in the 70s, he showed us that if mental states are identical to physical states, 
then they're necessarily identical to physical states. And we've already looked um, at this. When we looked at reallescence in week four, I think it was, um, we looked at this sort of argument. The thought was, if science shows that water is H2O, then what it's showing is that water is necessarily H2O. This is an a posteriori necess necessity. It's not a <coughs> contingent necessity. So if we're going to say that pains are C fibre firing, we've got to say that pains are necessarily C fibres firing. And if dogs don't have C fibres, then dogs don't have pain. And if Martians don't have C fibres, Martians don't have pain. And, and this is so counterintuitive that we'll turn around and say, well, actually, in that case, it can't be an identity. So it may be that science shows us that there's a correlation uh, between C fibre firing and pain in humans, but that correlation is evidence of some other relation. It's not the identity relation. Okay, so correlation can be um, evidence for all sorts of different relations, not just identity. Okay, in the 50s and 60s, others thought that reasons couldn't be causes. And that's because reasons, our beliefs and desires, are linked logically to their behavioural effects. So if we see, say that Fred is crossing the road because he wants an ice cream and believes that there's an ice cream van over the road from which he can buy an ice cream and that he's got... You've got to fill in all the um, other beliefs, like he believes he's got money in his pocket, maybe falsely. He believes that he can walk across the road. Uh, in the end, what you get is, is a set of beliefs that entail the action. They're logically linked to the action. They're rationally linked to the action, not just causally. And this is an interesting question. In the mind, or at least with, when you're looking at intentional states, um, the proper relations between them are rational. When there are causal relations between beliefs, it tends to be an error. So if your desire that your son isn't dead causes you to believe that your son isn't dead, that's a case of wishful thinking. It's a causal relation between a desire and a belief. And when that happens, there's usually something wrong. What we want is our beliefs to enter into rational relations. So one belief is evidence for another. One belief implies another. One belief entails another and so on. And anyway, Hume told us, didn't he, that there can't be logical relations between cause and effect. And if there are logical relations between reasons and behaviour, then they can't be cause and effect. At least so many people thought. But then Davidson came along. And again, we've already seen uh, what Davidson had to say um, about this. He believed that um, he distinguished between causation and explanation and showed us that reasons could be causes despite being logically related to their effects. So, for example, says Davidson, you can say the cause of G caused G, and that's not an explanation. It's deeply uninformative. The cause of G caused G. Um, but it doesn't mean it isn't true. It's a lousy explanation, but it's still a causal statement that's true. Um, and what he showed us was that Every uh, event, two events, so that's the cause and that's the effect, and every event can be described in lots of different ways. So uh, let's cause this one, call this one, um, uh, it's Marianne's writing on the flip chart. And it's happened at... 2.25, bloody hell, how did that happen? Um, it is hurried and so on. There are lots of different descriptions of that very event. And there are lots of different descriptions of this event too. This is David suddenly seeing 
the point or something like that. This happened at 2.26. Um, this happened, um, OK, David was the subject of this, not Marianne and so on. Um, and as Davidson says, actually, you've got to pick out a particular one of these and a particular one of these. And if that causes that, then that's going to be a true causal statement. Whichever of these descriptions you pick out and whichever of these descriptions you pick out. Do you see what I mean? So um, forget this stuff. Think of this as the event uh, described on page three of the Times. And this is the houses falling down, the house falling down. OK, so the event, it's, it's true statement to say the event that's described on page three of the Times caused the house to fall down. But it's a lousy explanation. It doesn't tell us anything. It's only when you know that the event that is described on page three of the Times is the earthquake that happened in Mexico, because both of them are descriptions of the same event, that you get an explanation. So you can have a true causal statement and a lousy explanation. But it's a good explanation only if it makes it intelligible, if it picks out descriptions that are intelligible to us and also has a true causal relation. So if you have uh, the earthquake that happened in Mexico and the house caused the house to fall down, that's a good explanation, but only if it's a true causal statement as well. OK, so that distinction between causation and explanation that I've appealed to in lecture three, I think, very important thing to find. And it, we found it when we were thinking about um, mental causation. OK, I think, let me just see what I'm going to. OK, let's, let's, has anyone got any questions about that? David. Well, we're, we're going to get on to that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any other questions about what I've said so far? Not about what's going to happen in the future, you think? Just to clarify, when we say mental states, are they choosing mental states, class states, or are we including mental processes? We're including mental processes. Yeah. Um, so uh, a mental process would be a, a process of reasoning from belief to belief. Um, so you, it, with the process, you've got the relation in as well as the states. Because in such a case, it makes perfect sense to talk about the location of mental processes. So. But anyway. What, why? Because in, in the brain, they will happen in a particular location. Um, that's if, if yeah. beliefs are in the head. OK, we're going to yeah. look about that, at that in a minute. Coming on to, from the first question to the second, which follows from it, uh, do we... As, as automatically assume that we have direct epistemic access to mental states? Um, that's not a question I've looked at, okay. uh, and I'm not going to look at it just now. Davidson appears to suggest no, hence the need for the different... Well, mental we all know that there are unconscious mental states. That's why I don't think we need to address that at the moment. Um, let's think mainly about states to which we do have conscious access. What I'm um, suggesting is that perhaps we don't at all, period. That, what we, that we do not get... Well, that's to not a question about what I've talked about, so, so if you don't mind, we'll okay. leave it till the end, if that's all right. Isn't, um, isn't colour both a physical and a mental thing, rather than just being physical? Uh, no, we have experiences as of green. Um, so I'm having experience as of blue at the moment when I look at these chairs. Um, but my experience isn't blue. OK, I, there's a certain quality to my experience, just as there's a certain quality to David's experience. I have no idea whether the quality of David's experience is anything like the quality of mine. Seems highly likely it is. But I don't know, and I never will know, whether it is or not. No, but what I was saying is Of altering the light conditions 
under which... Right. I'm not saying blueness is physical. I'm saying that objects are blue. Experiences are as of blue, um, rather than themselves blue. We don't say I have a blue experience, do we? At least not metaphorically, <laughs> unless we're talking metaphorically. I'm feeling blue. OK, I wanted questions actually on what I'd gone for. I'm very happy to take questions that uh, go wider um, later on. But let, let's stick to what we're talking about just at this moment. Is this? I think so. Uh, uh, this idea that a belief can cause another belief can be either a logical thing or an actual causal thing. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So if I believe, for instance, that my train goes at 4.40, that will cause me to get to the station by 4.40. Um, well, it's a reason for you to get to the station by 4.30. And I didn't really understand. I would know, might think that my belief that the train goes at 4.40 uh, would, would make me think, oh, I'll go to the, get to the station at 5 o'clock, that would be all right. So that the belief would have caused another belief, but stupidly. Well, you can't be irrational unless you're rational. I mean, that chair is non-rational. Yeah. Okay, you're rational. It might be stupid, though. Um, and because you can reason well, because you can reason, you can reason either well or badly. Yeah. In this case, you've reasoned very badly, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but in that case, wouldn't my first belief be a non-rational cause, rather in the sense that an earthquake causes a house to fall down, my belief caused me to believe something else? Well, I, we're going to talk about whether reasons are causes. I mean, Davidson says that there's no reason to think that reasons aren't causes. Um, what, when we pick out something as a reason, um, it's got to make the, the effect intelligible. Um, and, and as long as it does that, it's a good explanation. But it's only a good explanation if it's a true causal statement. So he's shown that reasons are indeed causes. So there's no problem with what you're saying at all. Um, but there are bad reasons and good reasons. Um, and both can be causes. OK, um, reasons, says Davidson, are causes. And that's because reason explanations are a, a, a species of causal explanation. So. All causal explanations cite something about the causal history of an event. So if that's the event, we can cite anything about the causal history of this event, and it's a causal explanation. But a reason explanation is a certain type of explanation um, of an effect. Um, and it's a, an explanation in terms of reasons. So. Ordinary causal explanations make sense of an event as one that fits with our picture of nature as uniform. So when you say that the uh, event, the house is falling down, was caused by the event that described on page three of the Times, that's not a good explanation, is it? It may be a true causal statement, but it's not a good explanation. When you know that the event described on page three of the Times was the earthquake, what you've got is the earthquake caused the house to fall down, which is both a true causal statement and a good explanation. And the reason it's a good explanation is that we know earthquakes are the sort of things that make houses fall down. Um, they're the sort of an event that's correlated uh, with the collapse of houses. Uh, so they fit, that, that explanation fits with our picture of nature as uniform. Um, but when we have a reason explanation, uh, it makes sense of behaviour as one that fits with our picture of the agent as rational. So when I explain Bob's behaviour, OK, Bob is crossing the road because he wants an ice cream. Why do I think that? Because he said a minute ago that he was feeling hot um, and He's, there's an ice cream man just over the road. He's walking towards it. Um, so I think my, my hypothesis is that Bob's trying to cross the road because he wants an ice cream. If he then walks straight past the ice cream van uh, and goes into a coffee shop, um, my explanation fails, doesn't it? 
he, he wouldn't have been rational to walk past the ice cream van if that's why he was crossing the road. Um, so the idea of a reason explanation is I've got to make it fit with my thought of you as a rational agent. So if I'm discussing something with David and he says something that I believe to be false, so he says P and I believe not P, I'm going to think, oh, so David says, the, David says that the chairs are red. How can he think that? Um, you know, he's like me. He knows the word, meaning of the word red. The chairs are obviously blue. Why is he saying that? So attributing to him the belief that the chairs are red won't make sense of him to me. Um, so I'm going to say, what do you mean they're red? And he says, oh, I'm just joking. OK, now immediately I can make sense of him again. Unless my rationality is perverse, then I'd have to tell you about that, wouldn't I? Um, well, people's rationalities are perverse to some extent. But actually, to the extent that they are, we're unable to understand them. I mean, we've all met people who think in a way that's quite perverse compared to the way we think. Uh, and it's quite a lot harder to understand these people. Um, let's... So... I'll perhaps explain a bit more here. Ordinary causal explanations are constrained by the principle of the uniformity of nature. What do I mean by that? Um, well, evidence for causal explanations is observations of correlations. Evidence against a causal explanation is observations of uh, failure to correlate. So if I say A causes B and then I see an A without a B, um, then I've got evidence against the claim that A causes B. I've not got evidence that A causes B is false. It may be that certain A's, only certain A's cause B. Um, but certainly if I've got an A that doesn't cause a B, the statement A's cause B is false. And it's the lack of correlation that's the um, evidence against it. Um, there was something else I was going to say here, but I can't... I can't remember what it is. I'll remember in a minute, no doubt. Um, OK, so the principle of the uniformity of nature, we think that causal relations are law governed. We think there are regularities involved. We think there are correlations involved. So all this, the principle of the uniformity of nature, the idea that nature is regular, um, is behind all our ordinary causal explanations. But when we're thinking about reason explanations, we appeal to a different principle. So if I explain your behaviour by saying, well, goodness, he's a man of a certain age, so what do you expect? <coughs> I might be right. <laughs> it depends what you're doing. Um, but actually, what I should be trying to do is make you rational. So if David says something that strikes me as false, I mean, forget the chair example, it's, it's a hard one to, to follow up. But if David says something that strikes me as false, I could dismiss him as irrational. Um, and we actually, we all do that. Um, think of the last time somebody said to you something that's, that strikes you as false and you decided not to take them up on it. It might have been a taxi driver on the way to the station or, or something like that. They say something and you think, you know, if that was a friend of yours, you'd take them up on it. But you're not going to take up the taxi driver or the porter at the, your college or things like that. Um, you're, you're going to let it go. Um, and it's also the case that you might let it go if you think that they know a lot more about the subject than you do. So you might be letting a lot of things I go, say, in past without challenging me on them, possibly because you're an lecturer or something like that, um, or because you think I know a lot more about it than you do. But again, actually, you're rational, I'm rational. If I say something that you think is false, one of us is wrong. If it's a contradiction, at least, if one of us says P and one of us says not P, then one of us is wrong. 
and it might not be you, it might be me. Um, so we should, we should always check when we see that. We might, if we get something that's, that's actually not a contradiction, and P and Q, where they don't seem to be true together, we might both be wrong. So, so think of a case where, sorry, this is a silly example, but I've always been using it and it seems to work. So um, a rat has been trained in a cage where, where a bell goes and he gets a food pellet. Okay, and another rat's been trained in a different cage where a bell goes and he gets an electric shock. And these experiments are both finished and the rats are put in, into a cage and they've become friendly. Uh, and a bell goes and one rat rushes to the food bowl and the other rat cowers in the corner and then nothing happens. And they say to each other, why did you do that? Are you mad? And they discover that they were both wrong, that they both had reasonable beliefs given that the experience that they've had, but actually they were overgeneralizing their beliefs. And in exactly the same way, if David and I disagree on something, we might both be wrong, or I might be wrong, or he might be wrong. The way to find out is to ask. And the principle of charity tells us that um, evidence for irrationality in a human being is evidence of error in your interpretation, your way of describing that human being. So if I attribute a certain belief to you and that belief is false, I should actually th think it's more likely that my interpretation is wrong. So that's, that's how beliefs differ from, or ra rather reason explanations differ from causal explanations. And Davidson went on to argue um, that we could, as a result of this distinction between reason explanations and causal explanations, show that mental states are physical states, which is what we wanted all along because it solves the causation problem. Uh, I'll explain the token in a minute. So Davidson believed that the distinction between reason explanation and causal explanation uh, would solve the problem of mental causation. <laughs> and at the time, many philosophers thought he was right. I mean, he was generally agreed to have solved the problem of mental causation. Whether he did or not, we'll have a look in a minute. But he did so by drawing to our attention what he called an inconsistent triad, um, a set of three beliefs which couldn't be true together, each of which seemed to be true, but which couldn't be true together. And the solution to the inconsistent triad is to see that they could be true together, but only if we understood the mental as being physical. So let's have a look at that. So here's the inconsistent triad. The first one is all causation is law governed. Well, we do tend to think that, don't we? Um, we, t we think, I mean, we might say that the laws are probabilistic, um, but we are going to say that causation is law governed. Um, so if you look at what our evidence is for causal explanations, evidence against causal explanations, the type of explanation that a causal explanation is, the fact that it un is underpinned by the principle of the uniformity of nature, that just seems to be straightforwardly true. The second in the inconsistent triad is there is psychophysical causation. Well, again, that seems to be just straightforwardly true. Um, so the psychological causes the physical. When I see that the traffic light is red, I put my foot on the brake. Yes. I have said accelerator in the past on this. Um, OK, when I see the light is green, I put my foot on the accelerator. When I've got a headache, I take an aspirin. So we, we think that, OK, I eat the ice cream and it, it's makes me feel less hot. So there's causation from the psychological to the physical, and there's causation from the physical to the psychological. There, there seems to be no question that there's psychophysical causation. Do you, are you happy with both of those? Would you like to quarrel with either of those, any of you? No? 
OK, here's the problematic one. There are no psychophysical laws. Now, do you see why this triad appears to be inconsistent? Um, if all causation is law governed, and if there's psychophysical causation, then there must be psychophysical laws, surely. If there's psychophysical laws and all causation is law governed, then there ought to be psychophysical causation. They, they, they just seem to be, sorry, if there are no psychophysical laws um, and there is psychophysical causation, then how can it be the case that all causation is law governed? Okay, they just, they don't seem, those, that seems true and that seems true, but the minute we add this to the group, we seem to have a problem. But, says Davidson, this is true too. Um, and the reason this is true is because of the disparate commitments of mental predicates and physical predicates. To get a law, we've got to see the two together. And if I try and get a law, Fred crossed the road because he wanted an ice cream. Well, there's no regularity there. If Fred crossed the road every time he wanted an ice cream, there'd be something very wrong with Fred, wouldn't there? Um, if I say uh, David did this because he wanted a glass of water, or it's raining so Sean took an umbrella, um, or it's raining so Sean did a dance, that might be a perfectly good explanation. Sean wants it to rain today uh, because he doesn't want to go out and he's been being forced out, and so this is a good opportunity for him not to be. But there's no regularity between Sean having that belief and performing that action. Um, with psychological states, there just doesn't appear to be the same regularity that there is with physical states. Um, and that, according to Davidson, is because of the disparate commitments of the psychological and the physical language. So, the one that there's no psychophysical laws, that's the one for which Davidson has to argue. That's the one that, that is problematic. And he thinks it's because of the disparate constraints on the two types of predicates. So the principle of charity versus the principle of the uniformity of nature. If you think of the stupidity of trying to think of a regularity, if you think of a reason explanation, you are uh, appeal to somebody's um, having done this because they want this or because they believe this and then think of them doing that every time they believe this it would just it just doesn't work we haven't got the same regularity so Davidson says we'll never be able to formulate laws combining mental and physical states because they're not fitted for one another the two types of predicate. And laws, of course, are linguistic. If we formulate a law, a law has got to be formulated in language, obviously. If all causation is law governed and there are no psychophysical laws, then the laws governing psychophysical causation, says Davidson, must be physical laws. And this tells us that every mental event must have a physical description. And it's in virtue of this description that it falls under a physical law. So going back to the same thing I had earlier, we've got this event causes that event. So that's the cause and that's the effect. Uh, and this has a mental description, believes P. And this has a, a behavioural description. Um, and... It's in virtue of, uh, but it also has physical descriptions as well. It doesn't fall under any law under the description believes P, but it does fall under laws under this physical description, says Davidson. And in the same way, this event here doesn't fall under laws under the behavioural description, but there are physical descriptions in virtue of which it falls under laws. So every mental event has some physical description 
in virtue of which it falls under a physical law. And that, for many years, was seen as the solution to the problem of mental causation. Um, and it's important to recognise that Davidson's is a token identity theory, not a type identity theory. So um, if you think back to the 40s and 50s and think back to the idea of the contingent identity, that was a type identity theory. So the idea was that um, all of these are beliefs that P So this is a, a class, if you like, and these are members of the class, the belief that P. And this is another class, um, neural state 476, did somebody say? Let's call it that. And each of these is a token of the type neural state 476. And there's a one-to-one -one relation between these. So every belief that P is a neural state 476. Okay, that's type identity theory. <coughs> Davidson's theory is not like that. If this is the class of beliefs that P, okay, lots of different tokens of that type, what Davidson claiming is that each one of these is a physical state. But there is no physical state type that is each one of these, if you see what I mean. So each one of these has a different physical description or can have a different physical description. So that's type identity theory. This is token identity theory. Do you see the difference? You're all looking very worried. Let, let's make sure that we understand that before we move on. If, if these identities are only tokens and not types, how come they, they can go under the PUN thing? Of, of, if, if the only way that they, they don't. Are, they don't. They don't. Um, so not the identities. Yeah. Um, they don't. Um, I'll say something about that in a minute. So, so that might... I should be able to solve that question in a minute. Any other questions about this before I look at problems for it? Uh, I may just be repeating Bob's question, in which case, just tell me, what differentiates the mental tokens from each other if they're all beliefs that... They all have a different physical description. Just that. Yeah. They're all beliefs that P, but they all have a different physical description. So, um, just as this is the class of red things let's say, each of them might be a different type of thing, but they're all red. So redness is what they have in common. What they, these have in common is the belief that P, but they don't have any physical state in common. Right. Okay. <coughs> okay. Let's, um, okay, so Davidson's is a token identity theory, not a type identity theory. Uh, and this is where I'm going to answer your question, I hope. There may be causal laws relating states that are, as a matter of fact, mental, um, with states that are, as a matter of fact, physical. So um, if this belief that P causes this um, behaviour Q, um, then this must fall under a, dis a physical description which is causally related to a physical description under which this behaviour falls. Okay, so physical description and physical description. And that will be true of every belief that P. Um, but there isn't any... Um, hang on, I'm just about to say that. But there aren't any bridge laws down here. So if you think of a causal law as underpinned by regularity, but a bridge law is an identity. A bridge law tells you that belief that P 
equals neural state 476. And that's a bridge law between predicates. So you're saying that predicate picks out the state of a type that's identical to that predicate. So there aren't any bridge laws, but there are causal laws. That's, that's the very important thing to remember. So um, the causal laws, of course, are all physical, not mental. They, they um, underpin that causal relation in virtue of a physical description, but there aren't any bridge laws, and that's why there aren't any uniformities there. OK, so Davidson's anomalous monism, he calls it, is a non-reductive physicalism. It is a physicalism. It shows that all mental states are physical, but it's not reductive. Uh, it doesn't reduce mental states to physical states. Uh, no, he's saying that when, when a mental state causes a physical state, there is a physical description of it. So it's not as vague as that. Um, it's true that it, what it won't do is tell you anything useful uh, about which state to look for. Um, but Davidson thinks the only way we'll ever identify mental states is by engaging in conversation, by using the principle of charity. So we'll never know enough about brains to be able to provide reason explanations <coughs> of each other's behaviour. Um, the only way we'll find reason explanations is by trying to understand each other as people, so in effect. A of this, right? no uh, right. Well, the argument um, is pretty good. He doesn't know that because he's not a theoretical neuroscientist. Um, sorry, the idea that it's non-reductive is based on a logical argument that... that well, he's based, oh, on a it argument based on existing <laughs> scientific knowledge, that's what I'm saying. He hasn't discovered that it's not neural state. Yes, OK. okay. If, 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 if neuroscience ever discovers that the belief that P is identical to neural state 476, yeah. uh, Davidson will have been proven wrong. Yep, yep. I really don't think that's going to happen uh, for all sorts of reasons. I'll tell you why, but, but let me go through this and then we'll open it to questions. Let's have a quick look. Um, so uh, objections were immediately brought against his claim, but let's have another way, uh, look at another way of showing that mental states are token states, so another type of non-reductive physicalism. The functionalist also claims that mental states are physical states, but he th does it by saying, firstly, that they're functional states. So pain is the causal role played by pain in our folk psychological theories. So we have a folk psychological theory. Pain is the state that causes us to withdraw our hand. It causes us to say, ow. Um, it causes us to avoid something in future and so on. Um, any state that plays that causal role, according to the functionalist, is uh, a pain state. So pain is realised by the, the physical state that plays the causal role of pain. Um, so whereas we have with anonymous monism, um, we have a, a mental state has a physical description. With functionalism, we've got uh, a physical description of a causal role which is played by, realised by, a physical state. And the important point about functionalism is that it permits multiple realisability. And we talked about this again in, in Lecture 4 um, when we were talking about real essence and so on. Um, so if a C-fibre firing plays the role of pain in human beings and we say that pain is C-fibre firing, um, we'd have to deny that dogs can be in pain, um, assuming that dogs don't have C-fibres.
But what we can say is that um, pain is whatever plays the functional role that defines pain. So it's realised by C fibre firing in human beings, D fibre firing in dogs, and something completely different in margins. Um, and that's permitted in functionalism, so that's not a problem. So notice again, we've got exactly the same thing. We've, we've got a class of um, mental states, in this case pains, um, and they're realised by different physical things. But here, we're, we've allowed more, whereas with Davidson, each one could be, related, could be something completely different. Here, we're allowing that these are humans, and they're realised by the same state, um, etc. You might also have noticed that whereas Davidson talks about propositional attitudes or intentional states, functionalism tends to talk about qualitative states or experiential states. So we can appeal to either anomalous monism or functionalism to argue that mental states are physical states. Uh, and this might seem to resolve the problem of mental causation. If mental states are physical states, why should there be a problem of mental causation? We saw right from the beginning that, that one of the key reasons for thinking that mental states are physical states is the idea that, that then we wouldn't have a problem with mental causation. So have these two, we've, we've seen the problem with type identity theory, but now we've seen that we can look at two non-reductive physicalisms and see that we can save maybe mental causation. But it's never that easy, is it? Um, there are two problems that haunt both types of non-reductive physicalism. Um, exclusion, which is the one you mentioned earlier, and externalism, um, which is the one I think Bob was mentioning earlier. Let's have a look at the two of them. OK, the exclusion problem answers that, uh, uh, argues that if causes have mental and physical properties, OK, so you're looking at one event, the cause, that has both mental properties, it's the belief that P, and physical properties. And if physics is complete, so if you think that every physical effect must have a physical cause, and if there's no systematic overdetermination, which is where you came in, David, then events that are, as a matter of fact, mental, can only have their behavioural effects in virtue of their physical properties, says the exclusion prop uh, problem. So I won't be able to find where I... Yeah. OK, so the belief that P causes the behaviour Q, um, but it does so, causes the exclusion problem, in virtue of its physical properties. It's not its being the belief that P that causes it to have the effect it has. It's its being neural state 476 that causes it to have the effect it has. That's what the exclusion problem says. Am I going to... OK, so, so those who think the exclusion problem is a good problem um, think that the mental properties of the event are shown by it to be epiphenomenal. So it's the physical events, uh, physical properties of the event that do the causing and the mental properties come along for the ride. So we've still got a problem with mental causation because you believe you do what you do because you believe what you believe, don't you? You believe that you um, say what you say because you believe what you believe. It's the mental properties of your states that you think of as causing your behaviour. But if this is right, it's not the mental properties that cause your behaviour, it's the physical properties of your mental states. Marianne, no, let me finish. Sorry, say that again. Why is that a problem for Davidson? Because as far as I can see... It, it, it's not, but I, I'm going to say that in a minute. Okay. Um, OK, so if you, if you accept the, the exclusion problem, you're going to think that mental properties are epiphenomenal. 
So externalism, oh, okay, so that was uh, exclu the exclusion problem. And I don't think it's a problem for Davidson, and the reason it's not a problem for Davidson is Davidson does not believe that properties cause anything at all. Um, so the person who believes this uh, is somebody called Yagwon Kim. Actually, he and many other people believe this, but he thinks that the, the relata of the causal relation are properties, whereas Davidson thinks that the relata of the causal relation are token events. And once you believe what Davidson believes, this is not a problem at all. Um, but I wasn't going to go into this at any length because we've already got an awful lot to think about. OK, anyone want to say anything about the exclusion problem before we go, go on to an externalism? I've got you all silenced. Bob's the only one who's got anything to say, and that's because he's done the Met Philosophy of Mind course. Does Kim, do Kim and people think this is just too bad? I mean, is it epiphenomenal world type? Or do they think this No, they think that, that there, there are type identities between mental states and physical states. So a lot of the people who bring the exclusion problem want to go back to the type <laughs> identity theory. Um, so to go back to the idea, that the belief that P is identical to neural state 476. And of course, they, they've got to grapple with Kripke's um, argument and so on, and all sorts of, and Descartes' argument indeed. OK, shall I get on to the externalism problem? Let's do so, and then we can just open things. Externalism says that ex intentional states have contents. Um, they represent the world. So you have a belief about me that I'm wearing a black and white jumper. Um, so your belief about me represents me as wearing a black and white jumper. Is that right? Um, arguably, this ensures that intentional states are not the sort of states that are inside us. We tend to think of our beliefs as being inside our head, don't we? <coughs> That's partly because we think that our beliefs are brain states and our brains are inside our heads. But actually... Um, what this would ensure is that they're states of the sort that we get into, not states of the sort that get inside us. So here's the difference. Uh, this is green. Can you see it? Mm. No. Yeah. Not here. No. Oh, that's because I'm standing in front of it, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so here's, here's a state of the sort that's inside you. And here's a state of the sort that you get into. OK, so um, if now the state of the sort that you get into isn't denying that there is something inside your head, but they're denying that that's the belief. The belief takes up. So if it's a belief, there's a tree. In front of me. OK, that takes into account the, the thing that's inside your head, which is common to a hallucination that there's a tree in front of me, OK, uh, and the tree itself. Uh, whereas the internalist thinks that it's nothing more than the state that's in your head. So an internalist, somebody like Descartes, for example, believes that the world could be completely different than it is, and yet you have the same beliefs that you have. But let me ask you a question. OK, you all have a belief about me now, don't you? Imagine if I didn't exist. Could you have a belief about me? Now, you could all, all have a belief that's you know, as if there's a lecturer in front of me and she's called Marianne and this, that and the other. You could, you could have a belief that describes me, but could you have a belief about me <laughs> if I didn't exist? Put up your hand if you think yes. Did you ever exist? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I exist. <laughs> but how would we know whether you exist or not? Uh, 
I'm not asking a, an epistemological question at the moment. I'm asking a metaphysical question. Could you have a belief? Well, actually, let me ask an easier question. Could you have, an ex, uh, could you have a belief about red? Could you have a concept red if you had never experienced anything red? You could? Put up your hand if you think you couldn't have a belief, a, a concept of red without experiencing something red. You couldn't. OK, I think you're right. A blind person, blind from birth, could have a concept of red, couldn't they? So they could believe, they could come to believe that strawberries are red, pillar boxes are red, things like that. But they couldn't have a concept of red that's like yours. I'm assuming that you aren't blind and, and indeed that you're not colour blind. Um, because to have the concept of red requires you to have experienced red. And I'm suggesting in the same way, you couldn't have a belief about me unless I existed. OK, well, you can suppose something about me. You can suppose that I'm my middle name's Jean, which it isn't um, or whatever. But you can only suppose something about me because you have the concept of me. And that's surely a day ray concept. You couldn't have that concept if I didn't exist. OK, um, he's putting together a description and I've already said you could have a you could create a fiction in your mind. That's a lecturer who lectures in philosophy, wears earrings, black and white jumpers. You could create such a fiction, but that fiction wouldn't be me, I think. So say, say you met somebody outside who had had <coughs> created such a fiction um, and you were talking about me and they were talking about their fiction. And you would at some point have to say, well, are there, you know, has this person coincidentally, coincidentally come up with a fiction that's exactly like Marianne? Is it a, th is it a thought about me? Is it a concept about me? No, it's not. OK, let me ask you another one. Those of you who are married, if your uh, wife or husband, God forbid, were spirited away tonight onto twin earth and they left behind them a, a molecule for molecule duplicate, okay, so you wouldn't know that they'd be swapped. Would this be the person, you wouldn't know, you'd have no idea, would this be the person with whom you exchanged your vows? Yes. How could it be? So Davidson talks about swamp man. If somebody comes out of the swamp and, and is molecule for molecule identical for you, to you, they would be married to your wife because of the identi identity, because of the qualitative identity. I'm suggesting that you'd actually have to have numerical identity for that. OK, so... Yes, and you can, can you, well, you've, um, you've known that gases are there. You know that the air is there, even though you can't see it. Uh, you've got the concept of invisibility, and you can combine that with your concept of man it's, it's just and come up with the invisible man. It's a word that can be described and explained, but you still can't Uh, no, you can't experience visibility, but you can um, you can experience seeing something, and you can use the not operator yeah. to negate it, and thereby get invisible. And you know that things can have effects without their being visible. So you might be able to touch them, but you can't see them. You might be able to hear them, but you can't see them, etc. Um, so you do have the concept of not visible. Don't you? Not visible. I'd say not visible, 
And invisible is slightly different. Well, invisible... Um, when it's dark, things are When we create ideas, we put together... So a unicorn, nobody's ever experienced a unicorn, but we've all experienced horses, we've all experienced horns, we can take apart the concepts and put them back together creatively. Say, you can all imagine that my shirt was yellow now, um, and that's because you've got the concept yellow, you've got the concept of my jumper, you can take them apart and you can put them back together creatively. Uh, you've got the concept of invisible, you've got the concept of man, you can put them together and you create the invisible man. Then you've got to put bandages around him, because if he remains invisible, you've got real problems. Um, but it's quite useful when he takes them off, um, because he can do all sorts of things that... OK, um, so that's what externalism says. Externalist says uh, that state beliefs are states of the sort that we get into. They're not states of the sort that are inside us. And if this is the case, we've got another problem. Um, the contents of uh, your beliefs are a function not just of their intrinsic properties, of the properties that are inside your head. Um, they're also um, a function of their relations to the environment, to the history, to your society, to your culture, and indeed to your community. Um, so your beliefs about me are partly a function of your relation with me, the fact you've seen me, you've met me, talked to me, listened to me, etc. Um, so you could not have the belief that you actually have without your being located as you are actually located in the world <coughs> as it is. Um, but if contents are ex essentially extrinsic properties, it's very, such an important word, I put it in twice. Um, <laughs> then again, we have a causal problem. And Surely it's only intrinsic properties that can be causally implicated in the production of behaviour. So imagine um, a vending machine. If I put a... Oops. Ah. If I put a... Um, ten pence piece... Well, actually, I'd need a pound, wouldn't I? So if I put a pound in it, um, I'd get one of these fattening things here. Um, but if I put into it something that had all the intrinsic properties of a pound, the right weight, the right shape, the right thickness, the right everything else, I'd still be able to get one of those fattenings, wouldn't I? Um, what's missing is that it's not a pound coin. It doesn't have the right history. It wasn't um, issued by, I don't know what the history of pound coins is, but I'm sure there is one. Um, it doesn't play the same role in our economy uh, as the pound coin does. Um, but the vending machine doesn't care. The vending machine works only on the intrinsic properties of the things that are put into it. And aren't you exactly the same? So if you have inside your head something with exactly the same intrinsic properties, isn't that going to cause you to do exactly the same as it would do if it had different extrinsic properties, goes the thought. Extrinsic properties, how can content, if it's essentially external, make a difference of any kind to our behaviour, goes this objection. So, there are numerous, so what I've done is I've looked initially at the knee-jerk theory of mind, which is the type identity theory, and shown that actually we went away from that pretty quickly. Um, it looked as if mental states and physical states must be different things. But then we looked at two theories that says, no, actually, despite appearances, they are in fact the same thing. Um, you've just got to be non-reductive physicalists, not reductive physicalists. So two theories that say mental states are physical states and therefore we don't have a problem with causation. Then I've looked at two problems to, th to this, the exclusion problem and the externalism problem, both of which suggest that 
okay, you're saying that mental, there are states that have both mental and physical properties. So the mind is the brain, but mental states are not physical states because they, they have different properties. Um, but actually, now you've got the problem again, all over, sorry, problem all over again at the level of properties. Don't physical properties exclude mental properties? Don't extrinsic properties get excluded by intrinsic properties? How can the mental be a cause of anything, um, given that it's externalist or given that it's not reducible to a physical property? Well, there are no numerous possible responses to both these problems. Um, and I've put uh, references in the handout. Um, but let's consider what would be the case if we can't solve these problems and the others. OK, so there are two possibilities. Firstly, we'd have to say that the mental is epiphenomenal. It only appears to you that you do what you do because you believe what you believe. Um, it actually cannot be the case. You're pushed around the world not by your mental states, but by your brain states. And your brain states are not the same thing as your mental states. Um, the other one is that we can get rid of the whole th darn thing. Why not just eliminate mental states? So the eliminativists think that um, we can have reason to think that we never act for reasons, that we should believe that we don't have beliefs. And believe me, it's not as daft as it sounds. Actually, the arguments for eliminativism are, are pretty damn good. And they start off by saying that folk psychology is a theory. We postulate beliefs in explanation of our behaviour. And because it's a theory, it can be false. And of course, any theory that's false, we've got to get rid of all its postulates as well. So just as we got rid of phlogiston when we got rid of that theory of how to explain things, so we should get rid of beliefs when we understand better how to explain our own behaviour. So, oh, here we are. OK. Um, I promise you the eliminativists are not as daft as they may sound. Um, but you'll have to look at that yourself. OK, so um, can we explain how reasons are causes consistently with reasons being physical? If not, we're going to have to be dualists and believe that the mental is not physical. And lots of people have problems with that. Um, if we're dualists, we have to reject the idea that physics is complete. Um, so they've got to be... Uh, physical uh, causal processes that pop out of the physical and pop in again. You can see why people didn't like being dualists. So that's it. We've only got five minutes left. But you can see why mental causation is a huge problem. Um, and there are many, many people working on it. And they're working in all sorts of different directions. Um, it, it's a very big problem. We have got five minutes to talk. Let's talk. Let me get some questions from behind, if, if there are any. No? Um, thank you. Where do, just going back to um, um, observations from science, as it were, things like the, the fact that um, things happen before we have... Are you thinking of libit? Yeah, I think about... Yeah. Where, where does that fit? Well, um, libit uh, had a number of experiments in the 1980s originally, but he's got a book out uh, in, in 2004, which is on the um, handout when you get it. Um, but he argued that he had shown that um, action potentials, which are not co conscious, um, <coughs> occur so many microseconds before uh, consciousness does, and that therefore um, he shows that there's no free will, he claimed. Um, and a philosopher called Mele, Alfred Mele, has, has, I think, debunked that um, claim quite categorically. I mean, if you're going to say that um, 
we've shown that uh, your intention only comes up after the action potential has started. You've got to be damn sure that you know what you mean by intention. And you've got to be damn sure you know what you mean by belief and desire and so on. Uh, and Melly, unfortunately, hasn't looked at those things. But, but have a look. I could have gone into that. In fact, I've got a podcast about that. Um, and you, if you, I'm, I must be able to find it somewhere. If you want to know more about it. Okay. Any other questions? If not, I'll have to ask. Oh, gone. You said that people are Yes. Well, I, I mentioned it when um, the exclusion problem is only a problem for, di for somebody who thinks that properties are mentally efficacious. Uh, and I mentioned that Davidson denies that. He thinks that it's only token events that are mentally efficacious. Um, and I, I agree with Davidson. So I don't think the exclusion problem is a problem at all for Davidson. Um, and that, that's one direction, but it's not a very common direction um, to go in. I think there is, again, there's somebody on the reading list who's, who's looking in the same sort of direction. Um, was there someone else around here? Because Mike. Oh, did you have a. Go back to Fred and the ice cream van. Um, if Fred wants an ice cream, it's obviously not the case that he would always cross the road to the ice cream van. But isn't that just like anything else in the, in the non human world? Just because there's an earthquake doesn't mean that house will fall down. Yes. Um, but the, because the, the, the laws which govern human behaviour are likely to be very, very, very complicated, just as they are in um, the real world. Yep. So when I drop my pen, it doesn't always go to the floor because something gets in the way. Yep. So yep, you're, you're absolutely right. Well, when we were looking at... And, and charity of when, when we were looking at um, causation, we noticed that um, actually there are very seldom regularities. I mean, you can strike the match and the match doesn't light because there's not, no oxygen around you, you didn't strike it hard enough, or, or etc. Um, so a cause has got to be a number of different conditions that together are sufficient. Um, even so, in the uh, non-mental world, we find those conditions often correlated often <coughs> enough that we see regularities um, in human behavior when we're talking about we see it um, I mean Davidson doesn't think that qualitative states are in fact mental he thinks that only intentional states are mental and if you think about my belief that it's raining what's the characteristic effect of my belief that it's raining um, surely there's no such thing it's going to depend on whether I'm going out, whether it's my wedding day, whether, I, whether it's this, that or the other. We'd have to write in so many different conditions that we would get a logical entailment, which is why people originally thought that reasons aren't causes. Isn't that the same for any physical thing? No. Well, fewer I was going to say, perhaps fewer. Actually, it's quite significantly fewer, isn't it? Because the brain is such a complicated thing. Isn't, isn't that just, just a matter of degree? Well, and Davidson thinks that because the brain is such a very complicated thing and what's more, um, beliefs and so on are externally individuated states, um, the only way I'm ever going to explain your rational behaviour is by using the principle of charity. So he's not denying that there is a physical explanation of what you do, um, and it's going to be a, an extremely complicated one. But if I actually want to explain what you're doing, uh, I'm much better off using charity. I'm much better off assuming that you're rational and trying to work out what I would be doing if I were in your position. But aren't you assuming I'm rational because everything you've experienced in your life to date um, is evidence for human beings being basically rational? 
Yes. So isn't that just the same as PUN? Uh, no, because there's no... Um, there's, it's not... A, well, uh, I see what you mean. Yeah, well, no one's denying that you're... I mean, you're an object as well. When I see an object like you, I'm going to assume that you have reason. Um, I might be wrong. I might be... You might be a Madame Tussauds <laughs> waxwork or something like that. Or a... Martian. Or a Martian. But actually, if I've interacted with you over any length of time, my belief that you're rational is probably going to be borne out by your behaviour, because you act rationally. Evidence. Yes. But isn't the same thing, my, my uh, interacting with my television set? Well, if I say he's a man of a certain age, <laughs> you know, he's going to be doing this, that and the other, you're going to get quite annoyed with me. Yeah, but you'd be right. <laughs> Sometimes I would be right, yes. <laughs> Sometimes I would be right. But I, um, I mean, I do a nice little thought experiment. Actually, we haven't got really time to talk about it. But the thought experiment, imagine that one day we found out so much about brains that we needn't any longer engage in discussion and uh, communication with each other. Um, I could carry my little app. Um, which would tell me what you're going to do because it would tell me the laws that are governing your brain, the initial state that your brain's in and what your brain is about to do. Um, that would be a very different way of explaining your behaviour than what I am actually doing, which is looking into your eyes and, and using empathy quite often to think, does he understand, does she understand... Is she looking puzzled? Might, if I explain it this way, is it going to make it easier, etc.? Um, I mean, Davidson thinks that's a whole different kettle of fish. But um, you would be doing away with free will if you did that. If I did what? If you had an app on your phone. Oh, yes. No well, free will well, determinism. Um, I mean, the. I thought I was going to mention determinism, but I haven't actually, have I? <laughs> But actually, determ eliminativism is determinism. Eliminativism is basically saying that what we are is, is determined by our brain states. Uh, if I had an app, it would indeed mean that. And actually, the ramifications of determinism are huge. It means there is no content. There is no meaning. Because if there are no beliefs, there are no, there's no truth. There's no meaning. There's no content. Um... It doesn't mean the world's any different from it is. I mean, it's if it is like that, it is like that now. Um, but we're just deluded into thinking that there's meaning and truth and etc. Right, with that happy thought, <laughs> that's the end. Um, I also, I there are a couple of things. Um, I'm going to be giving some lectures. Um, there's my Twitter feed and my Facebook. Do come and join me on Twitter and Facebook if you can. Uh, there's my website's there as well. And I'm giving some lectures on an introduction to metaphysics uh, in April. So when the weather's slightly better. Um, I've got some leaflets here. Do pick some up as you pick up the handouts. Um, and I hope I'll see you there. I've enjoyed it.